Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, special session organized by the International Affairs Journal team uh, at the Chatham House in London. Um, we have uh, Joseph Batora just arrived. Thank you, Joseph. He had a bit of a trouble with the connectivity, I believe. So I guess we, we will go by the order in which uh, we were supposed to speak. Um, as you know, international institutions are core element of the liberal international order. And international institutions, along with democ democracy, economic independence, the three other, uh, two other elements of the order are under challenge. And this special issue that uh, Marcus conversed from um, Vienna School of International Studies and myself, TV Paul, uh, edited. The issue is now available on probably online also, actually free to download until the end of uh, November. And the issue has some 17 articles on different dimensions of uh, globalization, deglobalization, as well as uh, the liberal international order. Today we are going to uh, use or uh, seek the help of two of our or uh, three of our contributors, uh, two of our co-authors, uh, Professor Joseph uh, Batora from the uh, uh, Vienna uh, from the Webster Vienna Private University, and Professor Katharina Coleman from the University of British Columbia and Brian Job, um, Emeritus Professor also at uh, British Columbia. Uh, both of them have a joint paper on peacekeeping. But um, uh, so please note that this is recorded. Your questions also will be recorded if uh, the questions we answer in particular. Uh, we only have an hour. That means uh, questions, all the questions may not be answered, but uh, Isabel, the organizer here has uh, promise us to combine some questions and uh, we will try our best to answer as much we can. So as we know that um, institutions demand our attention because much of the uh, international order is built around um, your, uh, this idea of institutional strength. Uh, but the two papers, actually the two articles deal with uh, these dimensions. So um, I'm going to invite Joseph to talk about um, the concept of interstices, how that is uh, that the way in which uh, institutional forms are developing and perhaps in simple language so that people <laughs> understand the concepts that are a little complex. And then we will go to the peacekeeping topic, Joseph. Thank you very much, TV, and I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful that we can meet and and discuss uh, with a group of colleagues. I appreciate uh, uh, your and and Marcus's input into putting the, together this uh, special issue. Now, my article uh, deals with uh, states' interstitial organizations and adaptations and prospects of adaptations of the liberal international order. And um, the argument um, I propose is that um, the, uh, there, is in, there are endogenous sources of change um, in the uh, liberal international order uh, as states try to adapt to what um, Cooley and Nixon had called a tilting of the liberal international order uh, towards a dominance and global acceptance of, um, of capitalism and free markets as one element in the Kantian tripod around which the liberal international order is built and moving away from um, uh, or, or, or moving away from what um, uh, you know are the other two elements uh, in the tripod which is um, uh, liberal democracy and human rights, as well as, um, as well as, of course, international institutions and international uh, organizations. So, uh, what has what we have seen is this tilting, which is an unfortunate development, of course, um, and uh, states try to adapt to it. My argument in the paper is that, um, in fact, with this adaptation process by which states set up 
what I call interstitial organizations um, in collaboration with various actors from the private sector, from the, from the non-governmental sector. Um, they, in fact, uh, contribute to endogenous change um, of, this, of this liberal um, international order. So uh, let me be a little bit more specific as to what I mean by the um, uh, interstitial organizations. Um, those are organizations set up by states um, as well as by private sector actors and non-governmental actors in the interstices, that is spaces in between institutional domains, tapping into resources from multiple uh, institutional fields and recombining these into uh, new patterns. Um, this is done because states as such are, of course, both uh, boosted and supported by the liberal international orders rules, but they're also constrained by a number of uh, rules in the international and norms in the international liberal international order. And um, that, of course, uh, leads them to try and find new forms and new ways of um, fulfilling functions that they need to have uh, that they need to have fulfilled there is a need for action capacity but there are also rules-based constraints um, of the liberal international order on states so um, states try to set up various new kinds of structures to deal with that and there are two empirical examples i use in the article uh, one is the european external action service as the diplomatic service of the european union which of course um, seems to be, uh, to some extent, the um, foreign ministry of the European Union, but it is much more than that. It is, in fact, combining the roles and functions of uh, the defense ministry, um, of um, a development aid agency, uh, of an intelligence agency, and, and more. And through that recombination, they bring about new patterns of practices that on the one hand enable the European Union as a non-state actor to do what states normally cannot do. Uh, and that is, for instance, promote democracy in ways that states and their diplomatic services cannot, uh, cannot support uh, by, by means of their own established practices because of the constraints of the rules of, for instance, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. So the European Union with its European External Action Service uh, can do things in promotion of liberal international practices of what um, Emmanuel Adler has called liberal international practices. It can do things that states uh, cannot do. A good example would be, for instance, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, when all the states uh, of the European Union, all the member states have had to leave Kabul uh, in Afghanistan uh, following the Taliban takeover, the European Union delegation uh, remains as the only diplomatic representation left in town. And the precise argument why they can do so is that they're not a state and they can do things that states cannot do. So on the one hand, these interstitial organizations are enablers for state action and enablers of, for combined practices of states and other actors. Uh, at the same time, though, they, of course, also um, undermine uh, state capacity and the role of the state as the core actor in the international order. Um, the other empirical example I use um, in the article are private military companies. Um, those are, of course, again, used by states to promote um, their own defense interests uh, or strategic interests uh, uh, in collaboration with the private sector, as well as other uh, kinds of actors. Um, and, uh, and they do so um, around the world. There's a global market for these kinds of services and private military uh, companies operate um, globally. But at the same time, they of course also undermine some of the core, core uh, tenets of the liberal international order as there is lack of accountability, uh, lack of democratic control, um, and indeed, then, of course, also uh, core liberal values and liberal norms are being undermined. Um, so basically, the interstitial organizations, such as the European External Action Service and the private military companies, enable states to do uh, what, what they otherwise would not be able to do. So they boost action capacity of the states. At the same time, though, they also undermine the state-centric nature of the international liberal international order as an order built on states and by states uh, and maintained by institutions that are, of course, um, state 
centric um, for uh, for quite a, for quite a long time. Um, so, in fact, when we're thinking about um, when we're thinking about what could happen uh, as two kinds of scenarios of adaptation as to how do we get a grip, how do we get some level or some degree of control over uh, you know, this somewhat unruly uh, kind of development endogenously within the international, liberal international order, we can think of at least two uh, scenarios. One would be um, a scenario of transformation of the liberal international order uh, which would be moving towards acceptance of non-state actors and entities um, that would be recognized on a par with states. Um, and, uh, and that would, of course, be going in the direction of what John Ruggie used to call or calls uh, heteronomy. So a system built around structurally diverse set of actors operating within the same global environment. Um, so in this case, we would uh, gradually be moving towards a shifting set of rules for a new kind of a setup in the liberal international order, accepting states as well as other types of entities operating within the same, within the same environment, within the same set of uh, rules um, uh, regulated by uh, international institutions. The second um, possibility or scenario that, I, that one can think of when we're looking at this is, of course, a sort of a path dependent adaptation of the liberal international order, which, of course, could go in the direction of resurgence of the state and strengthening the capacities of the state to control uh, for democratic control and democratic um, accountability. Um, so that would be my view of the two uh, paths of possible adaptation of this um, of this um, um, of this som somewhat unstable situation um, that has emerged uh, within the liberal international order endogenously due to the setup of interstitial organizations. Thank you, Joseph. That was quite interesting. Um, now we go to Katharina Coleman to talk about the liberal international orders the relationship with the UN peacekeeping then and now and why China and Africa are important now in terms of their attempts to reform or change the way peacekeeping is organized. Katharina. Thank you and hello everybody. It's both an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, so as just announced, we're turning our attention then to UN peacekeeping, which like so many global institutions is at an inflection point at the moment. And the argument that Professor Job and I are proposing is that the future of UN peacekeeping may very well be quite significantly shaped by China and African states. Um, and our sense is that that is less likely to lead to deglobalization than it is to less liberalization and certainly less Western led institutions. So I'll lead into that argument and then pass on to my colleague. And we begin by with a quick reminder that UN peacekeeping emerged before the global ascendancy of the liberal international order. So in the Cold War context, um, it was much less possible to inscribe UN peacekeeping within a particular ideology. The missions were smaller, tended to be um, focused on implementing or helping to um, implement ceasefires. So certainly after the Congo, after Anuk in the 60s, not a lot of nation building ambition. Um, they're also relatively few and largely concentrated uh, in the Middle East. So between 45, 1945 and 87, there were only 14 missions created, um, one of them in the Americas, one in Africa. The real inscription of UN peacekeeping within the liberal international order is really a post-Cold War phenomenon in the sense that the post-Cold War system sees both the ascendancy of the liberal international order um, and a vast increase and expansion of UN peacekeeping. So there are 52 new missions created between 88 and 2010, 27 of them in Africa, 10 in Europe, six each in Asia and Africa and in the Americas. Um, so we see a globalization in terms of that scope, a globalization also in terms of who is contributing troops. So by 2010, there's 115 troop contributing countries as opposed to 46 in 1990. 
um, and of globalization also in terms of the economics of it. So again, by 2010, there's companies in 91 different countries that have peacekeeping contracts worth about two and a half billion. So there is a globalization uh, in the connection between UN peacekeeping and the liberal international order. There's also a liberalization. So what we begin to see in the post-Cold War era are much more multidimensional missions with um, uh, parts of the mandate that include support for elections, assistance to democratization, monitoring of human rights. Um, so, and, and a more explicit statement of connecting uh, democracy to international peace and security. And at the same time, it becomes a more explicitly Western led um, institution. So in the 1990s, that includes in terms of peacekeeping contributors by the mid 1990s, of course, Western states start withdrawing from UN peacekeeping as contributors, but keep political control or political influence, um, both in terms of um, the three Western permanent members of the Security Council, who have formally become pen holders on most UN Security Council resolutions that are connected to peacekeeping by 2010, and also in terms of financing. So again, uh, by the 2010, about 90% of the UN peacekeeping expenses are being assessed to liberal industrialized democracies. We are, however, at an inflection point at the moment um, that partly reflects long-standing tensions. Um, so including Western states relative absence as large troop contributors, which has changed a little bit in the last couple of years, including uh, a larger UK commitment that we can speak to. A shift to more robust peacekeeping and stabilization uh, mandates, which then also enhance the risk uh, associated with peacekeeping deployments, which are unevenly born then amongst states. Increased contention in the Security Council. There has not been a major new peacekeeping operation launched since 2014. Um, and a persistent and increasing uh, demand for budget cuts, all of which means that since 2015, the number of active missions has gone down from 16 to 12. The budget is down 22%. Uh, peacekeeping deployments are down about 31%. Um, and then COVID gets layered on top of that, all of which puts UN peacekeeping at the kind of inflection point um, where the future development becomes a question of where, where is this institution going to go? And our pitch is that China and African states are going to be are very well positioned to play a major role in shaping that future for a couple of reasons. So China, on the one hand, of course, a permanent member of the Security Council, increasingly assertive in that capacity. It is um, the largest P5 permanent member contributor to UN peacekeeping by quite a margin with almost 2,300 troops deployed as of August of this year. Uh, the only developing, claiming developing country that is a major peacekeeping uh, financer as well. Um, worth noting that it's China's share of the peacekeeping budget um, is currently standing at 15%. Looks like it's set to increase as we renegotiate, as the UN renegotiates those rates, likely at least by the indicative rates that the Secretary General has just uh, released to go up to 18.7% if the methodology doesn't change, whereas the US is going to decline by a percentage point. Uh, so that puts China very squarely as a major actor in UN peacekeeping. And African states equally have an expanding role in UN peacekeeping for several reasons. So first to preface, Africa is of course not a monolith. Um, there are various, there are 53 African states, there are various positions that they take with respect to peacekeeping, uh, but some uh, major commonalities. Um, one is it's the, been the UN's largest troop contributing region uh, for over, for about a decade. 47.6% um, of the total UN peacekeepers deployed in February of this year uh, came from various African countries. 13 of the 20 largest troop contributing countries are African, including four of the top 10. Africa, African states are host to most major UN peace operations, six of the 12, and they host 84% of UN peacekeepers that are currently deployed. And Africa has emerged both as uh, regional organizations and as a continental AU operation as a major partner in UN peacekeeping. 
um, in terms of co-deployments, but also in terms of successive deployments where regional actors have been first responders to regional crises and then uh, a follow on UN mission comes. So six, seven of the 13 new missions in Africa uh, have been rehatted from regional missions. So the argument there is simply that both China and Africa are major players um, that are well positioned to shape where peacekeeping evolves. And with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Job. Yes, Professor Brian Job will discuss how the peacekeeping is going to shape up in the future, at least from the author's point of view, and why they don't want deglobalization, they want more globalization, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, TV uh, and Marcus, for the enormous amount of work you put into creating uh, this issue of uh, international affairs. I've never seen anything proceed as quickly to publication as you have managed to put this together. And I also thank the editorial team uh, at International Affairs and, and Isabel for arranging this particular webinar. Uh, I've been given a question that's a real mouthful, which is how do these actors, that is China and African states, how may they change UN peacekeeping in the future, uh, but why they don't want deglobalization. And start with the premise that peacekeeping is in essence the flagship of the United Nations. And as goes peacekeeping, as goes, if you will, the reputation and the legitimacy of the United Nations itself. And I'll put that on the table and then proceed with three quick components in response to this large, if you will, question I had. First of all, it's just a very quick assessment as to where we're starting from. What's the current status of UN peacekeeping? Secondly, then, how could and would Chinese and the Chinese and African states change peacekeeping, <clears throat> excuse me, if the dilemma and the deadlock in the UN Security Council was broken? That is, if UN peacekeeping became acceptable and feasible again, what would we see these two states uh, uh, look for in peacekeeping? And thirdly then, and perhaps most importantly, how China and African states may undertake peace operations with the UN Security Council that continues to be paralyzed for the foreseeable future. What sort of peacekeeping activities can be imagined or, or do we see already uh, within that context? So first of all, the current condition of UN peacekeeping, Professor Coleman is, has, has certainly given this and, and told us that we are at a, at a crisis and an inflection point. Uh, it's substantially diminished, uh, but it remains uh, globalized. It's also heavily regionalized in the sense that Africa has the majority of, of personnel, uh, most all of the, of the large missions, but there are also then uh, traditional um, missions uh, mainly in the mainly associated with the Middle East and we have no effective peacekeeping going on in Central America, Latin America, Asia, or Eastern Europe, right? But as I used the phrase earlier, paralyzed. UN peacekeeping is paralyzed. No new missions since 2014. Russian and Chinese vetoes have meant that there have been, and this is where the issue of legitimacy becomes important. There are no responses to humanitarian crises in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Venezuela, and, and Myanmar. Peacekeeping then is in uh, a difficult position. So the second aspect of the question would be, well, okay, let's assume that, that we, we see many of these dead, many of these roadblocks uh, diminished or, or even removed, and what would a revised and functioning UN and UN peacekeeping look like from Chinese and African perspectives and, uh, and intentions and aspirations. But I would say that China and Africa have complementary demands and substantial mutual compatibility of interests and results as, as Professor Coleman has, has, has shown us. And they have two twin, they have twin priorities, de-Westernization and de-globalization. Uh, and sorry, not, I'm sorry, not, I meant to say de-Westernization and de-liberalization. And so de-Westernization refers to the operational uh, aspects where both seek greater influence over policy and decision makers. China rebels against the penholder system that sees France, the UK, and the US as basically controlling the agenda of, and the, and the uh, mandate creation 
of the Security Council. And China also looks to increase its representation at senior headquarter and missile and mission uh, levels commensurate with what they see as, as Professor uh, Coleman has noted, commensurate with what they see as a substantial increase in their uh, position and contribution to, to, uh, to the UN and to UN peacekeeping. African states seek African-led solutions to continental problems. They look to having AU positions taken into account, contrary uh, notably to what happened in Libya with Libya in 2011, where the AU was on record of, of being opposed to uh, interventions that proceeded uh, despite that. But the African states certainly retain the notion of globalization because they do not see that African problems need to be solved financially or otherwise simply through uh, African states. They don't have the monetary and material capacities and they regard these problems as essentially global problems. In terms of, of, of de-Westernist, de deliberalization, uh, they wish to constrain the normative shift that's going on uh, and has gone on as, as, as Professor Coleman has said, democratization and re regime change and return, if you will, to a UN with primary focus on state sovereignty, non-intervention, non-interference, in other words, the Hammerschel principles, an emphasis on states and strong and capable states, and a notion that is sometimes attributed to the Chinese of a developmental peace, focusing on security, sovereignty, and stability. And here, human rights are seen then as economic and social rights that are to be provided by the state. Okay. So what does this UN look like in terms of peacekeeping? Well, say four quick uh, points come to mind. There will be fewer missions. Okay. There will be a narrower view of challenges, what, cha what constitutes a challenge to international peace and security. We're already seeing that. The argument of, of opposed to the opposition to acting in Myanmar was that was an internal situation. The argument against providing uh, argument against providing humanitarian assistance crossing borders is that uh, this is not this is a matter of, of state provision and, and its own uh, sovereignty. There's going to be an emphasis on bolstering state capacity and state responsibility for its own citizens. Has, has become and will continue to be a principal argument for non-intervention rather than for intervention. Okay. The two sticking points here, uh, particularly for the Chinese, one of them is the Chinese resist the use of force, even of their combat capable troops as they're posted in, in, South, in South Sudan. And this is contrary to the support that African states give for uh, in initiatives like the Intervention Brigade and give to the very active uh, counterterrorism. And the Chinese view then of primacy of the UN Security Council, uh, if you will, runs up against uh, the efforts by the African Union and others to assert uh, the right to initiate. So thirdly then, what do what are peace operations in this what I'll call post-traditional UN peacekeeping context look like? The premise that peace operations, multilateral responses to conflict, uh, largely transnational conflict and human cri crises will continue. Uh, Professor Coleman and Paul Williams make a strong argument argument for this in a recent piece uh, put out by the IPI, but they acknowledge that peace operations are constrained and enabled through the geopolitical context set by the major powers. And here, I think we, we see little enthusiasm, little leadership among the major powers, the P5 for proactive leadership to advance UN peacekeeping. This especially in the aftermath of Afghanistan, rise of nationalism and also the COVID pandemic. The initiative stead is going to be taken by regional actors and multilateral coalitions of regional states responding to transnational challenges. Non-state actors, as opposed to state actors, are the primary, if you will, opponents in these particular contexts. This phenomenon is already being demonstrated in Africa, 
where beyond the established UN missions has come an array of hybrid missions involving regional and sub-state actors, and notably also participation by the European Union. And thus, for instance, you see two UN operations supplemented by contributions uh, from the EU and the CAR. Uh, for instance, in Mali, you have the support of the EU, you have the EU task force led by France, you have the Sahel Joint Force, and by then the remainder organized by the AU, uh, Amazon with 19,000 troops uh, supported by the, by the European Union in two operations. Chad has 10,000 regional actors in, in coalition against Boko Haram. And in, in Mozambique, for instance, Sadak along with Rwanda uh, looking to meet insurgents. For China, I would conclude by saying China, I think, will remain comfortable on the sidelines. It supports African initiatives. It will continue its major financial contributions, 100 million to FOCAC over five years, but there's no indication I can see of China moving to new missions or increasing existing ones. Finally, in conclusion, Rosemary Foote has recently uh, written a, a very interesting piece on, on the UN speaking to China, but more generally, and she raises the larger question regarding the long-term viability of a model of the UN that is based on national determined priorities, sovereignty protection, and does not take into account and engage civil society, non-state actors, uh, and, and uh, uh, private and individual actors as well. The legitimacy of the UN will not survive in a return to a sovereignty protectionist Institutional, uh, in, institutional logic of the post-World War II mid 20th century environment. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was terrific. Um, all the speakers uh, uh, managed to present uh, their points in exactly on time. So we have uh, uh, about 20, 25 minutes for Q&A. Uh, may I encourage the participants uh, to go to the Q&A function and type your questions. We already have received a few questions. The first three actually are probably more related to Joseph's presentation. Uh, let me just read them out quickly. Joseph, you can combine your answers since we have, don't have much time. Make sure the answers are short <laughs> and succinct. What are the main challenges states face when they try to assert authority within these organizations? And are these attempts uh, ever successful? If we move towards more actors having as much power as states, what does this mean in reality for NGOs, particularly those with a diplomatic role? And finally, do we need to look at new institutions and states to reform the liberal international order system, particularly in light of the US retreat from the system and as Joseph said, the system has endogenous issues. So the question I think is about states and uh, how they are reacting to the situation that you discussed. Yeah, thank you. I think these are, these are all uh, great questions because they go to the core of the regulatory challenge that we have here. Uh, you know, it, it seems as though uh, global practice um, uh, has gone away, uh, ran away from the possibilities of regulation that we have, uh, that we have had here in a, in a um, world of international organizations built around states and state-centric regulatory mechanisms. If you look at, uh, for instance, the private military companies, uh, it gets very difficult uh, to, um, uh, in most cases, in many cases, not most cases, but many cases, it gets very difficult to actually regulate, um, to, uh, to find out uh, where exactly, you know, in some cases you, you have thousands of troops deployed, yet it's, it's difficult to pinpoint um, where exactly these companies are actually headquartered. Uh, where are they legally liable? Uh, where do they do they pay taxes at all? If they do, um, you know, uh, to what extent they do so. So there are some governments um, that are actually willing to work with companies uh, these days that are not exactly clearly um, clearly connected to any sort of um, any sort of a, a, a normal regulatory framework. Um, you can think of, uh, for instance, the Wagner Group, um, a company uh, very often associated uh, with Putin's uh, Russia, 
Um, but also there are a number of other companies. Now, in the Western world, we have had some developments uh, where one tried to has been trying to develop various kinds of regulatory means by governments, by states, uh, to uh, to anchor uh, such interstitial organizations such as the private military companies in the regulatory frameworks of these these states. Um, and that is one of the means or one of the instruments is, uh, for instance, you do not get contracts with the with the US government, with the Department of Defense or uh, the State Department, unless uh, you are a member of the uh, so called International Code of Conduct Association, um, which uh, is um, very often, which is, uh, uh, you know, operates under uh, under the auspices of the uh, of, of Switzerland. Um, and that's a way of that's a kind of a soft law instrument rather than rather than a classical um, hard law. Yet it still provides some degree of uh, of regulation and, and monitoring. So uh, so states try uh, try and operate and set up various regulatory frameworks, uh, legal regulatory frameworks, um, uh, and and uh, various monitoring mechanisms that could help us regulate. Uh, but it's not exactly uh, it's not exactly. Um, a very stable uh, set of institutions at this stage. So we find ourselves in a, in a bit of a volatile uh, stage in the international order where the state-centric institutions uh, no longer uh, provide for uh, efficient regulation. And, uh, and there are no new institutions at this stage that we can rely on. So, um, so I think this is uh, this is exactly um, uh, a, a, an, an area or uh, an environment in which you have a bifurcation of new organizational forms, various kinds of innovation, uh, organizationally, but at the same time, um, at the same time, of course, uh, lots of instability in terms of regulations, laws, norms, uh, and their application and their, their enforceability. Thanks, uh, Joseph. So the next question is actually for on the peacekeeping topic. Uh, China may have the capacity to be more involved in peacekeeping, but they haven't shown much interest in leading world movements. If this is the case, what does the future look like for UN peacekeeping? There was another question about possibly Russia's role. Has Russia got a role in peacekeeping? Perhaps if you don't want to answer that, that's fine. But if you have something to say, but China is an interesting case. They are selective of these institutions and clearly some institutions they're using to reform the system uh, in their favor. Uh, and that is a challenge, especially the liberal hegemony of these institutions. But other institutions, they are uh, free riding basically. And so what does that mean? I think perhaps Katharina and Brian, both of you can answer those questions. Well, I was going to say China, I'll also throw it back to you, Brian, but, I think the Russian side of things, if, if we start with that one, uh, I mean, Russia and China have been um, combining in their criti criticism of the more liberal aspects of UN peacekeeping mandates. Um, and often mandates are, are happening together. Um, sorry, often votes are happening together on, on these mandates. And there's a, a joint um, uh, discontent with the pen holder system uh, that both China and, and Russia share um, because of the dominance of the, of, the Western, um, of the Western powers in the Security Council. The difference between Russia and China in peacekeeping um, is the, um, the other sources of power. So Russia does contribute um, uh, peacekeeping, peacekeepers, um, but as of August, there are 70, 79 deployed that puts Russia in 63rd position, as opposed to China, which is in 10th position. That's the 10th largest troop contributor to UN peace operations. Um, and equally, um, China's budget contribution vastly outweighs Russia. So that gives China's arguments about peacekeeping uh, the kind of a, a much larger heft um, than than Russia's has on its own, and China has developed its ties uh, with various African states, um, and uh, especially through FOCAC, as Professor uh, Job has suggested, um, in ways that are that are simply more um, uh, that that are, that are more developed than than Russia currently has. Um, so that I think would be where where the difference between between Russia and China uh, comes in. 
Professor Job, can I throw to you the question about China and institutions? Well, very quickly on, on to that. Um, you, one asks what China wished to accomplish by engaging in peacekeeping to the extent that it has. And by and large, I would say it has achieved what it, what it set out to do, get profile, status, and expand, its, if you will, particularly its soft power agenda vis-a-vis -vis, uh, third world and particularly within, within the African context. It has, it has shown no interest in expanding their, those missions or taking on new missions. And I don't see it doing so uh, in the future other than by some exceptional circumstance the UN standing force is called for and, the, and China has large numbers of troops ava available uh, for, for, that, for that purpose. So, Interesting points. There's a question about regional groupings like ASEAN. Uh, what is their role in uh, both larger scheme of things or are they affected by the challenge to the liberal order? Then there is a question on um, how states are using intergovernmental organizations as platforms to enhance their foreign policy. So I think it's relevant to both of your papers uh, the fact that uh, this is not a one-way street, uh, states are receivers as well as uh, that they are using in institutions for their purposes, as we discussed about China in particular in, in this case. So perhaps, um, Joseph, and, and in all the three of you can answer that question a little bit. All right. So I think, uh, of course, uh, the of course states uh, do try to use international organizations to their benefit, and uh, and and of course the international organizations that we see, in particular, for instance, the European Union, um, is a boost in the sense that it's not only a simple um, simple collection of the resources of the member states that then is put on the table um, as if in an equation. It's more like a, um, a transformatory type of an organization which enables the European Union member states to do what they themselves would not be able to do. So the good example is what I mentioned earlier, which is you know the diplomatic presence and access in um, Afghanistan following the, um, uh, following the takeover by the Taliban. Now, the member states of the European Union had left and, and you know, their diplomatic posts, the, the embassies had shut down because by interacting with the Taliban, um, you know, countries like France or Germany or, um, or, or other member states of the European Union, uh, they would be recognizing the Taliban, they would be providing a degree of recognition as states, as governments, because this is how, of course, diplomatic recognition comes about as well in these kinds of practices, informal interactions, diplomatic interactions. So the European Union stays there, uh, its delegation is open, and it stays there because it's not a state. Um, and it can be there and, and, and still have, provide presence and access to the European Union's member states. Now, that's, that, 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 that's this transformational aspect of, um, of um, uh, these international organizations such as the European Union. Now, there's also what we could call a structural pull factor of uh, such groupings as the European Union, because in global order interactions, of course, um, other regions and regional groupings, um, uh, regional organizations such as the ASEAN, uh, find it easier to interact with the European Union if they do establish similar structures as the European Union, right? So that's that's where you see a sort of an um, a structural imprint that the European Union has on interactions with other world regions, other regional organizations, be that the African Union or ASEAN. So in that sense, I think there is a degree of a new wave of Europeanization um, following on what used to be a Europeanization of the, um, of the uh, world order in the sense of the spread of the state as a dominant model of political organization based on European experiences, territorial sovereign state. Now we might have um, a new, um, new wave of such uh, structural process that, uh, that eventually might lead to restructuring of, of interactions. I know, Catherine, you have some response or? No, I, I can speak I, a little bit. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I can speak a little bit to the regional, um, to the regional question um, in the sense that the demand for, for consultation or for, for further influence that African states are advancing is 
ultimately within the sort of framework of thinking about how the UN relates to regional organizations in general. Um, and the Security Council has for a long time uh, declared its, um, its, its willingness and its readiness to consult with regional organizations. What the Libya uh, intervention that Professor Job mentioned earlier sort of highlighted was a question about what follows from that consultation. So if the African Union says there should be no military intervention of any kind, does that, does that have to be respected? Does that have to be taken into account? Um, so the African position is very much that conflict resolution in Africa needs to be African led. So there needs to be not just consultation, but meaningful influence in how these missions uh, are launched. And that translates fairly readily into similar arguments for other regions, the, the logic would be, would be the same. Um, so it is about thinking about how the UN makes its decisions and interacts with regional actors. And then of course the question is always exactly who represents those regional actors. Again, in the Libya case, there was a, um, the, the League of Arab States had one position and the African Union had another and, and, and that enabled, um, uh, different positions to be justified with reference to regional groups. Um, but the larger question of how the UN relates to regional actors is very much one that travels to other regions as well. Hmm. Brian, you have some? No, I'll, I'll leave time for other questions. Okay, so there are actually some rather general questions and one on uh, uh, related to this uh, issue of de-Westernization of the UN peacekeeping operations. Will that uh, spread to other facets of the international order and, or uh, spreading to other regions beyond Africa? Because I think it's the larger question is about global governance, whether it will be more democratized. And, and, and your paper gives the impression the Western countries, they're liberal internally, but internationally, they may not be. They are still hegemonic. They want to continue the dominance, which is what these actors are challenging because they want real democratization. And, and that is where there is a disjunction between the liberal principles when it comes to domestic versus uh, uh, international. Perhaps that's the question the questioner, uh, the person is trying to address. And actually, there's another related question whether uh, change in international order, isn't it for good? I mean, that we had an order that is so liberal dominated or Western dominated, and uh, shouldn't we expect some change? And, and how do we address that issue? And uh, something like that uh, is what is happening. And it's it, nothing to worry about. That's sort of the sense. Anybody wants to respond? Well, I think it depends on what you see as gained, being gained or being lost uh, in moving away from the, the current, I guess it will characterize it as basically it has been a hegemonic uh, US managed uh, international order. If you remove that uh, from, from the, the international scene, uh, you, you presumably gain the advantage of alternative perspectives and new viewpoints, but you also lose what many have argued is a necessity, which is a, a, is a central actor capable of providing the collective public goods of international order uh, to the system. So I think, I think it cuts both ways. Uh, saying we have, to, we have to remove the current order uh, doesn't resolve the issue of how are we going to continue, uh, however well it's being done now. How are, we, how are we going to continue the provision of, of the international public goods of health security, for instance? I might, um, yes. I might just add that you might want to separate the question of de-westernization and de-liberalization, right? Yeah. So the notion that it automatically has to be a Western-led international order, I believe is in question in many places and perhaps that automaticity is, it's not necessarily a bad thing to lose the notion that any order necessarily has to be led by Western states. It does then, however, raise the question of 
as Professor Job says, one who is going to provide the leadership and what values are, uh, are, are being led towards. Um, and that requires perhaps making the case on substantive grounds for particular liberal principles, if those are to be defended, um, rather than simply um, mandating them um, uh, fr from, a, from a Western leadership position. Uh, since we only have a, a couple of more minutes left, uh, maybe we will go for some final thoughts. Um, uh, perhaps Joseph can start. Before that, uh, I must uh, point out that there are very interesting articles on these same questions in the same issue. There's an article by John Owen on the two orders that are emerging, one uh, Chinese-led uh, or inspired and the one Western-inspired. So the question can be answered by perhaps kind of a binary, but at the same time they are interconnected because they are using the same institutions that the Western uh, liberal order has created or supported over the, over the time. So take a minute, uh, each of you, Joseph, uh, start with you, you and then uh, conclude, we can conclude on time. Thank you. Thanks. I, I suppose I'll just um, uh, I'll just say that um, of, of course we're uh, we're living in a, a kind of a very dynamic uh, period of time, and for us as political scientists, this is really really exciting times. Um, at the same time, of course, we uh, we're not sure uh, to what extent this or this shift that we are experiencing right now uh, really isn't undermining what has been a great achievement uh, of humankind, and that is. Um, you know, the liberal international order as an order built around the principles of protecting universal human rights. I guess what it comes down to is to what extent uh, is the idea of human rights and human dignity um, a universal value, uh, something that isn't just an European imposition or a Western imposition on the rest of the world, uh, and, and something that's really shared by, by humanity as a whole, uh, irrespective of, uh, of, um, of origin uh, and so on and so forth. So, so the question is, I guess, you know, what sort of institutions and institutional arrangements, organizational arrangements, structures can we set up? Uh, to make sure that such great achievement uh, since uh, that we have since enlightenment would be maintained. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to be, um, um, as Katharina has said, a Western centric order, but it has to be, should be um, a liberal uh, centric, uh, liberal international order. Um, uh, for, and whatever structures uh, enable that, um, we, we should, should of course embrace that. But that's more of a, more of a normative position. Thank you. Brian or Catherine, Brian. Um, thank you. I, I would build on, on what Joseph has just said, which I, I think is a very, very strong point. Uh, there is, however, I think a, a sharp distinction between uh, positions that say that individual rights are uh, central, uh, prominent and, and indisputable and some notion that collective, the collective right and the collective uh, aspirations and rights of a community have also uh, a viewpoint. We see these pitted against each other in the current international uh, context and, and often very simplistically, but I think it's, it's a very complex question which is not going to be resolved by a continued insistence on there being uh, a singular notion of universal values. Okay, Katharina. Now with such eloquent comments, I think I would simply like to use my time to thank you know, the audience for being here, you as a chair for so ably chairing us and to echo Professor Job's thanks about a really remarkable special issue that you put together. Um, yeah, thank you. So the, actually my article is a concluding article which talks about re-globalization and adaptation of the liberal order, which include, uh, including this idea of global governance and domestic reforms that we still need the liberal order, but definitely a reformed one, not what it is going through right now. That's kind of my pitch, my last article, my uh, article in the in the special issue. So the special issue is available for downloading. It's a very unique thing for OUP until the end of November. Please go there and collect your articles and uh, engage these topics. Uh, we thank you so much for attending and uh, Chatham House for organizing, Isabel in particular, and all the panelists. 
So hope to see you and there will be one more uh, round table like this uh, with Professor Conburst organizing in a few weeks from now. Thank you very much. See you all.